Welcome to our online lecture series, Raid in Action. As every Tuesday, we are broadcasting live from Wachberg in the beautiful Rhineland in the west of Germany. My name is Jens Siegel, and I'm delighted that so many from all over the world are joining us again today. What is it about today? As I'm sure you all know, creating images using radar is not quite as simple as taking a photo with a camera. Complex mathematical procedures and a lot of computer power are required to create images from individual radar pulses. This is already complicated if you can control the transmitter and receiver yourself, and they are in the same place. It gets even more difficult if you use digital TV transmitters as illuminators. But this is exactly what my colleague Dr. Yole Pichotano has been working on, and she completed her PhD in this field. She will show her results today. Please, Yole, go ahead. on the topic uh, DVBS based passive radar imaging. On such topic, I'm working uh, together with my team leader, uh, Dr. Cristallini from Fraunhofer FHR and in collaboration with the University of Rome, La Sapienza. So one of the most recent development in the field of passive uh, radar is the possibility to produce images of a target by means of inverse synthetic aperture radar processing, the so-called ISAR processing. If you consider the DVBS the transmitter, so digital video broadcasting satellite transmitters as illuminator opportunity, we can take advantage of uh, their uh, simultaneously transmission in orthogonal polarity ratio in order to enable passive polarimetric imaging. So uh, today uh, with this talk, I will try to answer the following question. Can we increase, as have been already done in the active case, the amount of information that can be extracted from a passive ISAR image of a target by means of polarimetry? To this end, I will first introduce you the passive radar imaging, especially using DVBS satellite. Then I will show you the SABIA system, which is an experimental system developed and built at Fraunhofer FHR. Afterwards, uh, I will detailed ISAR imaging principle and the full polarimetric processing chain, which will be applied to the experimental data. At the end, I will give you the conclusion of the research and some uh, looks, looks to the future works. Uh, passive ISAR is, um, is a powerful tool to uh, image target uh, by using a system with no requirements for dedicated transmission, thus uh, giving us a long list of advantages. But of course, on the other end, since we are using um, uh, as illuminator of opportunity a non-cooperative transmitter, we should uh, uh, consider that we have no control on the transmitter signal property and that could affect uh, the image quality in terms of uh, both SNR and resolution. Uh, between the illuminator, the different illuminator of opportunity, uh, DVBS is providing a wider bandwidth, and higher sensibility in Doppler, and a wide offshore coverage, especially in coastal environment, with respect to the uh, usually deployed terrestrial transmitter. Uh, and so, uh, enabling in this way uh, mar uh, maritime target imaging. Low direct signal interference and uh, also the, um, the, the transmission available in both orthogonal polarization are two further advantages. Of course, we have to consider some limitation, uh, especially related to the target tracking, the power, the power signal budget and the range resolution. But uh, in this, uh, we can um, use uh, as a countermeasure uh, the combination with uh, target tra tracking systems. We can increase the acquisition time and uh, uh, also combine images obtained with different uh, polarimetric channels, uh, but also from different angles of view. In order to, um, to acquire signal um, from the VBS system, uh, we developed at Fraunhofer FHR the so-called SABIA system, which is working in the KU uh, frequency uh, band. Uh, as you can see on the picture on the left, during uh, the data acquisition, uh, a range Doppler map is possible to, um, is available in real time. 
the system uh, is, is um, uh, constituted, uh, constituted from uh, two identical parabolical uh, antennas. Uh, one is the reference antenna, which is pointing to the gas astronomy satellite illuminating the scene, and the other one is the surveillance antenna, which is uh, tracking the target of interest and is equipped with an optical camera, as you can see in the slide, and uh, with an automatic antenna alignment. The system includes also two identical receiver front ends and high speed ADC and data recording. In the ISAR imaging, uh, usually we have a stationary radar with a moving ideal rotating target. Of course, we can see uh, such geometry also as we had a moving radar with a stationary target. So, as be, so uh, is usually the, the case of the SAR um, images, which are maybe more known in the literature. Uh, but while in the SAR context, the scene can be relatively extended and the platform motion is usually no, in our case for ISAR, uh, we are just focusing on the target. So we actually need for high resolution image and uh, also the target motion is usually not no. So we have to estimate the motion and compensate it in order to obtain a focused radar image. Uh, if we also um, consider the intrinsically bistatic uh, geometry of the, passive, or the passive system, we also have to make some assumption to, uh, to, uh, to facilitate the interpretation of the ISAR images in, the, in this context. In the, so, uh, since we are dealing with a passive system, of course, we have no control over the transmitted power at the true orthogonal polarization. Furthermore, if you have a look at the sketch below, uh, the orientation of the H in vehicularized antenna are different between the reference and the surveillance channel. That's uh, why from now on I will refer to HR, VR, HS and VS. Um, when we are going to perform the full polarimetric operation, we, can, uh, we cannot use the conventional uh, operation as inductive case, since in our case, the DVBS satellite carries multiple transponders, or which are overlapped and interleaved in the H and V polar polarization simultaneously. Uh, what we are doing is then um, cross correlating the orthogonally polarized receiving signal at both reference and surveillance antenna in order to obtain the range compression signal. That's actually the first uh, part of our, the first step of our full polarimetric processing chain, which is here depicted. Uh, the input are the four polarimetric channel. Then after the range compression, we are obtaining a, a four range Doppler map where we can uh, detect and extract the target uh, of interest. Afterwards, uh, we have uh, to, um, to focus the target, um, uh, the, uh, but uh, the, in our uh, research, actually, we want, uh, we had as main goal the, um, uh, the comparison and combi in combination of either images obtained with different angle of view and with different polarization. So today I will uh, not focus on the um, uh, focus algorithm, which is uh, be already be done extensively in the literature, but uh, I will consider a back projection algorithm, which is exploiting the target motion information extracted from an inertial motion unit located on the cooperative target in order to obtain either images in a common reference frame, actually a target fixed frame that will enable an easy comparison between uh, either images with different angle of view, so different projection plane, and also uh, between um, uh, different polarimetric products. And since actually that's a quite uh, novel topic, we will also avoid inaccuracy that are usually uh, provided from data-driven focus technique, and we will characterize a sort of upper band of the achievable performance. So once uh, we get the four polarimetric ISAR images, we can then apply our uh, passive polarimetric analysis. In order to acquire uh, the um, data, we performed a measurement campaign along uh, the Rhine River in Bonn, Germany. As you can see on the picture, the receiver si receiving system was located uh, along the Rhine, uh, the surveillance uh, uh, was tracking the target, and uh, the reference uh, antenna was pointing to the DVBS transmitter Astra 1KR. 
the acquired bandwidth uh, during the acquisition was 80 megahertz, around 11 gigahertz, and a bi-static angle of about 37 degrees was experienced. As compared to the target, the ferry depicted in the picture below uh, was, was considered. If you look at the length and width of such a ta ta target, and uh, we um, we consider the result obtained until now in the literature for passive ISAR, that's quite a small target. So this target was equipped with an IMU, which was located on the central superstructure, as indicated in the picture with the uh, red arrow. From the IMU data, we were able to uh, obtain the trajectory of the target, which is here depicted in blue in the latitude longitude coordinates with respect to the position of the receiver indicated with the red marker and the direction of to the VBS transmitter indicated with the black arrow. We can also uh, project such trajectory in a target fixed system, as you can see on the right, uh, where the target is depicted in blue, and we can here uh, clearly see how the target was actually uh, completely rotating around itself during the acquisition in order to obtain uh, almost ideal ISA imaging. Considering the attitude of the target over time, if we have a look to the roll and pitch angle, their value were quite negligible over time, while the main attitude was the heading or your angle, which is showing a quite linear variation over time. For the polarimetric analysis, we will uh, focus on three different data frames, A, B, and C, which are uh, highlighted with uh, the green, blue, and black box in the HRHS profile in decibel. Uh, in order to choose such data frame, we consider not only a sufficient SNR, but also a target rotation uh, suitable for ISAR, and uh, for the mode visibility of different scattering centers, since uh, in most cases the center of such was giving a strong uh, return, was providing a strong return, thus uh, shadowing all the rest of the target. On the right, you can see uh, in a target fixed uh, geometry, the top view of the bi-static geometry for uh, the three data frame. In particular, you can notice uh, the slightly uh, different uh, uh, angle of view of data frame A and C, while uh, for data frame B, uh, we are expecting to uh, look at the opposite side of the ferry. In the table below, you can see all the parameters for the data acquisition. In particular, the coherent processing interval was already uh, always fixed to 0.8 seconds. And by considering the angular velocity value and the bi-static angle value, we are expecting to obtain images with a bi-static range resolution of about 3.9 meters and a bi-static cross-range resolution of about 0.5 meters. So when we apply the Kno motion back projection algorithm to the data frame A, we can see uh, the, the, this, uh, the following, uh, we can obtain the following ISAR images, uh, which are um, uh, in the target uh, fixed uh, uh, plane. <clears throat> Here we can recognize uh, that each polarimetric channel clearly highlights different scattering center. In particular, we can uh, notice a brighter return from the central superstructure in the HRHS map, while for the other copolar channel, less strong scatter are visible. Uh, of course, the cross polar channels are different because of the bi-static geometry, but in both cases, we can notice similar stronger scattering behaviors in correspondence of the ferry jack. Uh, if we have a look uh, to the signal to noise ratio of uh, the three data frame, we can recognize that data frame A and C are presenting a higher SNA uh, for uh, almost all the um, polarimetric pair. So uh, such uh, good SNR enable us to uh, make a real uh, polarimetric investigation in order to discriminate among different scattering regions um, in, uh, within the target. So we will introduce uh, different uh, decomposition and uh, polymeric features uh, available uh, in the literature in this case. And while for the data frame B, which is presenting a lower SNR, we will uh, try to put together the four images uh, by introducing different image domain techniques in order to obtain one single image with uh, a better quality. The first decomposition that was applied to data frame A and C was the well-known uh, Pauli decomposition, which was in this case adapted to the bi-static case. You can see here uh, for both uh, 
data and RGB representation overlap it to a top view of the target. The different colors are then associated with different combinations of the copolarized and cross polarized channel. And when we can recognize actually that the, the green color is more evident um, in correspondence of a deck, uh, just um, uh, which is uh, related then to the cross polar channel, while the copolar channel, uh, which are more related to the red and blue, uh, are uh, more present in, in, um, uh, with respect to the superstructure and uh, along the bow of data frame C. Then we also applied the polarimetric entropy and the mean alpha angle uh, after a, a noise threshold of, a, of 13 dB. You can see uh, the result for data frame A. In particular, uh, the low entropy values uh, for data frame A are uh, indicating as a stable scattering behavior, while for uh, the mean alpha angle, we are uh, uh, obtaining different uh, uh, values, indicating as uh, in the central part uh, uh, something which is, can be associated to volume scattering uh, mechanism, while along the deck, we can recognize uh, double band scattering. For the data frame C, unluckily we obtained a bit noisier behavior, but what is interesting in this case is the low value of the mean alpha angle, which is uh, uh, indicating us a surface scattering behaviors. Such result can be also uh, projected in a plane. So for each image, for each pixel in the image, we can calculate the entropy and the alpha angle after the threshold of 13 dB, then we, associate, so we obtain then a point in this entropy alpha plane. And the different colors here, magenta and green, are associated to the different regions that we uh, uh, identified with the Pauli decomposition along uh, the x-axis. We can uh, clearly see in both cases how the peaks associated to the different colors are grouped in two different areas. That's confirming us the result observed in the Pauli decomposition. And that's also uh, telling us that also that in the passive case, we can use polarimetric data in order to uh, make uh, a differentiation of the scattering mechanism within the target. To further uh, investigate this, we also applied the principal component analysis. Here you can see the result we obtained for data frame A after threshold of 13 dB. We can recognize that similar uh, result of, before, uh, of that one before uh, of the analysis can, uh, are obtained, just suggesting us that even if actually we didn't calibrate uh, the data, uh, the polarimetric channel were quite incorrelated and orthonormal. We can, of course, uh, apply the RGB representation also to the data after the uh, PCA, obtaining similar result to that one before the PCA. But uh, what is interesting here is uh, this three-dimensional plot where the three axes are uh, a combination of the principal component. And uh, the colors are also, uh, as before, are associated to different uh, positions along the x-axis. And we can uh, really see here in this three-dimensional plot how the, the different mechanism can be uh, divided. So that's uh, once again um, uh, saying us that uh, um, in the polarimetric domain, also for the passive case, we can differentiate different scattering mechan mechanisms that are um, uh, uh, happening uh, within the same target. For the data frame B, as already uh, said, we observe the lower SNR. In this data frame, uh, we, uh, we are able to uh, nevertheless to see the target feature along the opposite side of the ferry and on the upper part of the stern. And we will try so now to uh, put together these four images in one image by introducing uh, three different image domain techniques which are available in literature. These are uh, the result we obtained. We can see how the different elements are now in one image. We are obtaining quite a uh, similar result. And uh, the, in, uh, all, in all cases, we are also minimizing a lot, a lot the noisy background so that the target features are more visible. Of course, we can apply such image domain techniques also to the data frame with higher SNR, as we did here. And uh, if we have a quick look, we can see that actually we could put together the polarimetric information with uh, the different angle of view in order to further improve the recognition of several target elements. So let's sum up uh, my talk. Uh, 
Uh, today, we considered ISAR images presenting different angle in order to recognize distinct structure present within the target. Uh, we uh, considered uh, different uh, bistatic polarimetric feature techniques in order to uh, separate into polarimetric domain between different scattering mechanism uh, within the uh, image target. For uh, the case of uh, low SNR image, we also considered uh, image domain techniques in order to obtain a single image, but with higher quality. To conclude, so we demonstrated the feasibility of polarimetric passive ISAR imaging based on DVBS transmission. So we made actually a step forward to passive target identification and classification. Let's uh, have a quick look to the future works. Uh, the fusion of multi-angle data with uh, multipolar data has been recently presented to the, uh, the IEEE radar conference. Actually, uh, we are working on the stability, on, we are investigating the stability of the CNO motion back projection focusing algorithm uh, uh, with the variation of the target motion attitude. Uh, by considering uh, the um, uh, data acquisition, we plan uh, to install an upgraded version of the DVBS based system Sabiam on a moving platform that could be a boat or a ship in order to even extend the offshore coverage. When the, this, this will uh, work well, of course, we can also think to uh, consider a multi static and MIMO experiment to further improve the image resolution. So I thank you all for your attention. Uh, many thanks also to the German uh, uh, Ministry of the, for the Defense for the financial support and to all my department colleagues uh, for both the technical and scientific support. So if you have any question, I, I am here to answer it. Thank you, Jule, for your heavy talk and many information and very hard to understand for me. So, but I'm not a scientist and there are some questions. Um, I will go forward. Uh, okay, here is the first question. Why DVBS? Would other digital and time synchronized signals with more locations be better, such as DAB or GSM? So, uh, so thanks a lot for the question. It's very interesting. Uh, there are already some um, some works uh, that are using, for example, G GNSS. They are also quite um, good. But in this case, uh, we were also trying to uh, use uh, so the advantage of the DVBS, which is a wider bandwidth and. Uh, the, the possibility to exploit a different polarimetry in order to uh, overcome the usually uh, lower um, um, image quality. Okay, so here is the next question. Could the, um, no, okay, no, no, this, what is the possible maximum range between target Ship aircraft surveillance antenna for useful image for target identification. So, in this experiment, uh, we were able to to see the opposite side of the river, which was uh, about at uh, one one kilometer and half away. Uh, anyway, so the range is also depending a lot uh, from the. Um, from the uh, target, uh, the, the, from the orientation of the target, the position, the velocity, and uh, the backscattering uh, properties. Okay, um, a very detailed question. Could you identify a GPS antenna on a ship? That's quite <laughs> interesting question. GPS antenna on a ship, um, so I, I don't know what this means, but what, what we could identify is actually the, the, um, the antenna which are, uh, the active antenna which are on the ship. So they are moving, so maybe by making a Doppler analysis, we could uh, recognize such kind of antenna, but a GPS antenna, I don't think so. Okay, I think it's very small. 
Um, are there any greater advantage to using DVBS over other illuminators of opportunity? Would you expect similar results using, for instance, DVBT, terrestrial DVB? So actually in the literature there are a lot of uh, results uh, with DVBT, the most used illuminator, but there are some limitations uh, due to the, the bandwidth, uh, which, are, which are quite, uh, uh, so they are uh, so not that wide, so they are providing um, uh, so good resolution. So, and also if you are looking to maritime target, uh, the, uh, the, um, so the DVBT signal could actually not be available there. Next question. Could these concepts also be used for pre precipitation? measurements instead or in addition of weather radars, precipitations measurements instead or in, in addition to of weather radars. So um, that could be another uh, option to use it. Of course, should be further investigate of that will be possible or not. Yeah, OK, that's not our focus <laughs> this time. Um, no, no. And is it expected that the polarimetric features depend on the B static angle? Yes, of course, uh, the geometry is also uh, accounting a lot in this uh, in this case. So that's why we tried to we did such experiment with a control uh, motion of the target in order to uh, to check if some if we can see something. Then uh, by varying the bisectic angle, we should uh, perform further investigation and further uh, experiments and check if uh, our result can be uh, actually validated in the most general case. OK, here comes a long question concerning the military use of passive radar. First, which resolution is currently possible? Second, what is currently the maximum velocity to provide images to moving targets? And third, which experience have been made to provide images to moving targets in the third dimension, air? So quite a lot of uh, questions. So the resolution, uh, so, uh, as I said during the presentation, this for this experiment were about 3.9 meters uh, for the range. That's depending on the bandwidth that we acquired. While for the cross range, uh, it was about uh, half a meter. That's also depending on the velocity of the target, actually. Then uh, the uh, second question was, uh, uh, maximum, maximum velocity. velocity. Uh, so we are uh, we did this um, uh, this trial uh, with using a, a ferry that was uh, uh, of course uh, not that uh, with not that speed, but uh, uh, the target was uh, also very small. So I think that uh, that's depending uh, the, the velocity. So we cannot say a value about the velocity, but it's also depending uh, on the, the, the target itself, so the sites and the main scatterers present on it. The third question was uh, the 3D targets. dimension. Uh, uh, provide images to moving target in three uh, dimension. We acquired uh, during another measurement campaign also some um, uh, some uh, um, flight flying, uh, so there were some airplane, and we also obtained some images. Of course, uh, not uh, with uh, the same resolution because of the distance, but anyway, also in this case, uh, further investigation can be done. Okay, well, is it possible to fuse at hay? adjacent channels from the DVBS spectrum into one image? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, during this measurement, we alway, already collected uh, more channels uh, 
um, if I remember where there were two channels for the H polarization and three channels for the V polarization and uh, the gap uh, are uh, not that uh, deep. So we can uh, we use that uh, without any preprocessing and that enable us uh, to obtain a wider uh, resolution in the images. But of course, if the system will upgrade, we can also um, use more channel. Uh, more uh, the DVBS transponder and then further improve the radar resolution, the image resolution. Okay, so here is the last question. A looking angel changed more than 360 degrees with topographic, tomographic imaging principle. We can obtain much higher resolution. Is this right? So if I understand well the question. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it means that we are uh, looking at um, diff all the different angles around the target. Uh, of course, that will uh, permit us to see different scatter for different point of view, and that's also resulting in higher resolution. That's uh, of course uh, will be also a good uh, good solution to apply the tomographic imaging. Uh, thanks a lot for the suggestion. Okay. Good. That was it for today. Thank you, Jule. Thank you all for the question. Thank you again for your participation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, you will get a short survey tomorrow. We would appreciate it if you would take the two minutes to answer the four questions. On Friday, you will also receive the presentation slides from today. And in case you didn't know, in about three weeks, the presentation will be published on our YouTube channel. It's the best to you subscribe to our channel Fraunhofer FHR, then you won't miss anything because the next video will publish this Thursday there. Finally, let's take a look at the next lectures. Our next session is in two weeks on June the 1st in German. Additive Herstellungsverfahren für Millimeterwellenkomponenten. The next English talk will take place in three weeks. It will be about the Horus project how radar helps to protect pedestrians. More information can be found on our website, Radar in Action. So if you haven't registered yet, do it now. So see you then next week. Take care and stay healthy. Goodbye.